Uh, I'll tell you what I did want to talk about today, though. This was a a cool idea, something I had heard something about, but a listener sent me a longer article about it. It's a idea from antiquity that I think actually captures a lot of the ideas we've been talking about on this show about slow productivity. So I'm going to load up an article on the screen here that I'm going to be talking about today. So let me do a little bit of a share here. So uh, for those who are listening, you can see the article on your screen if you go to youtube.com slash Cal Newport Media. This is episode 260. You can also find this episode 260 at thedeeplife.com. Uh, so I've loaded up this article on the screen from Big Think. Here's the headline, Festina Lente, a Roman emperor's guide to getting stuff done. So I'll start from the top of this article, then we're going to get into it. So the Roman emperor in question here is Octavian Caesar Augustus. And this opens by saying, like all historical le- legacies, the one of Octavian Caesar Augustus is open to interpretation. Right, so he steered Rome through tumultuous times and ushered in a centuries-long period of order and stability known as Pax Romana. On the other hand, he delivered the killing blow to the Roman Republic and established a position so powerful that it gave subsequent emperors such as Caligula and Nero carte blanche to indulge their whims. So, you know, you got the, you got the, uh, the good and you got the bad. But here's the, the key point here. Whatever your take on Caesar Augustus, you've got to give him this. The man knew how to get things done. And the article mentions a lot of things that Caesar Augustus did as emperor, uh, a lot of projects to improve Rome after its many wars, his new tax and census systems. He created police forces and fire brigades. He built roads, instituted a uh, postal service. All right. So this is a guy who was uh, effective. All right. So let's return to the article. That's one heck of a curriculum vitae. He managed all of this not only by being clever, ruthless, and politically savvy, but by following a modest yet powerful Roman principle, Festina Lente, which is often translated, make haste slowly. All right, so this is a idea that I've seen. I looked into this idea when I was researching uh, my book, Slow Productivity. This is coming out in March. And so I've gone down this rabbit hole before, but it was interesting to see this take on it. This notion of Festina Lente, make haste slowly, comes up all the time in antiquity. So you see it, it wasn't just Caesar Augustus, but it actually comes up all the time. So let me jump back to this article here for a second. There's some uh, graphics to share with you here. All right, so let's look at this, the history of this phrase. They say here, the history of an august oxymoron. An ad here. All right. Did I say Roman principle? Well, not exactly. Like most things Roman, Festina Lente is Greek in origin. It's a calc or loan translation of the phrase, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it's a Greek phrase. The Romans simply borrowed it, gave it a Latin polish, and then invoked the time-honored tradition of no backsies. But while Augustus didn't originate the principle, he did devote himself to it in a history, in a biography of the first Roman emperor, the historian uh, Suetonius, described how Augustus changed the military following the final civil wars in the Republic. He notes how Augustus thought nothing more derogatory to the character of an accomplished general than uh, precipitancy and rashness. To quash such impulses, Augustus trained his generals to instead make haste slowly and that the cautious captain is better than the gold. How serious was he about this? Augustus minted a Roman coin known as an aureus with his personal branding of Festina Lente. On the side that didn't include his face, he imprinted the image of a crab hoisting a butterfly. The butterfly represented speed, the crab, caution, and deliberateness. Here's another graphic here. Uh, This is another Festina Lente graphic. You see here a dolphin around an anchor. I have this on the screen now. This was uh, Aldous uh, Manutius, a Renaissance humanist who revolutionized the publishing industry, adopted Festina Lente as his business uh, ethos. So this was his publishing imprint. So in the Renaissance, they rediscovered this idea. Uh, Cosmo de' Medici also illustrated this with a turtle sporting a sail on top of its shell. So there's, I'm seeing there's one more image in here. Anyways, there's a lot of images. What I'm trying to say is this idea of Festina Lente showed up a lot. 
so we see it. Uh, the Greeks came up with it. The Romans were really into it. It was minted on coins. The Renaissance humanists rediscovered it. They used it. Medici had artwork commissioned around it. A famous publisher in the Renaissance period had a, it, as the imprint a dolphin on an anchor. There's if you if you look online, you can find all sorts of other artifacts from the ancient world and from the Renaissance period where we see exactly this phrase captured in imagery. So it's a very pop, uh, very powerful, popular phrase. Now the question is, what is meant by this, and why is it relevant to us today? Well, I think the literal translation "make haste slowly" is a little bit hard to follow. There's a, as noted in that article, a bit of an oxymoronic element to it. How can you be uh, making haste if you're going slowly? Haste is fast. Slowly is slow. So I'm going to offer here. Let's call it an interpretive translation. So it's not a literal translation of what do these words mean, but an interpretive translation, a way of rephrasing this phrase, which I think gets to the core of what the ancient world and the Renaissance scholars who studied it thought about it, what they thought it meant. All right, so here is my interpretive translation of Festina Lente. Work slowly but relentlessly on what matters. Work slowly but relentlessly on what matters. So let's go through the three parts of that one by one, and I'll elaborate what I mean here. So slowly in this context means, of course, obviously, don't go fast. This is certainly what Caesar Augustus had in mind when he worried about his generals in the field being rash in their decision making. When you're too rash in your decision making, you act in the moment, you act on instinct, this can create problems. And if we bring this forward to the modern context, we can imagine it saying, don't let busyness and frenetic activity distract you from what actually matters to keep you from your best work. It could be reassuring in the moment, like the general that wants to make a decision and send their archers over there. It can be reassuring in the moment to do things. Let me do this and send this email and, and hire this consultant and publish this thing and, and start using this new tool. You feel like the activity is action and action is better than inaction. But Festina Lente is saying, slow down. Don't act hastily. Now, the cost in the modern context is not you're going to lose the battle, but it might be you're going to lose time, that you're going to get distracted, that your energy is going to be redirected from the types of activities that might have been most important for what it is you're trying to get done. We can think about this call to slowness also as a call to craft. Slow down. Focus on what matters. Work on your craft. That's what's going to matter. Okay, so that's the first part. Work slowly but relentlessly on what matters. What do I mean by relentlessly in this interpretive translation? Well, this is where we get to my take on the haste piece from the original translation. Don't delay or procrastinate. Don't overanalyze. So Augustus didn't want his generals, Caesar Augustus did not want his generals uh, to act hastily, but he also wanted them to act make the right moves when they need to be done. Don't react in the moment to your instincts or your fear. But when you see this is the right move, all right, I slowed down. I'm looking at the battlefield. That's a feint. Here's their weakness. Okay, we need to flank. Once you realize the right thing to do, because you slowed down, do it. Don't overanalyze it. Don't procrastinate on it. So this is where we get that oxymoronic tension. Slow down. Don't just be busy and frenetic. But be relentless on working on what you're working on. This is the next thing to do. Do it. Do it well. Take a beat. What's the best thing to do next? Do that and do that well. So it's the, the constant activity done intentionally and with care aggregates to really big results. And I think that's the takeaway of the second piece for the modern context. Working slowly but relentlessly builds up. And if you do that long enough you do end up with really interesting results. Even if in the moment it looks slow, if you don't stop, if you keep making progress, you keep putting out one podcast after another, very carefully trying to improve each episode from the last. You keep putting down another page of the book you're working on, and maybe it takes you longer than someone else, but you give enough time, you have a book that you're really proud of. This work relentlessly, don't stop. Keep making progress is the key counterbalance to the slow. And then I added the matters piece. So go back to my translation, work slowly but relentlessly on what matters. 
So what I mean by what on what matters is, okay, making sure you're focused on the right things. So slow down. Don't just be reactive. But when you do, keep making progress relentlessly. Don't stop. And make sure you're aimed in the right direction. So you, the, the generals for Caesar Augustus hearing Faustina Lente, they know what they're trying to do. We're trying to take this high ground. We're trying to take this city back from uh, the barbarian hordes. They know what matters, and they don't lose sight of that. That's what we're trying to do. And then they slow down so they're not being too reactive, and they make the relentless project on progress on the right decisions in the moment that push them into long term towards what matters. So work slowly but relentlessly on what matters. That is an ancient piece of wisdom. As we saw, the Greeks talked about it. The Romans stole it from them. The Renaissance humanists that rediscovered the Greeks and the Romans stole it from them. So everyone who has encountered this idea has adopted it with enthusiasm, which from a mimetic standpoint tells us there's probably something in this idea that fits well with human nature. And I think this is really exciting because once we see it elaborated in this way, this concept dovetails nicely with the philosophy of slow productivity that we talk about so often on this show and that I elaborate in the the book I have coming out in March. Now, it's not an exact match to slow productivity, but it's in the spirit of the slow productivity mindset, that spirit of slowing down, doing less, being more careful about your decisions, staying focused on the things that matters, but also keep making progress. You keep moving down the path. You keep making progress towards what matters. Trusting in the short term, you're just focused on making a good decision and building something, a step you're proud of. And in the long term, you end up at a cool destination. That's classic slow productivity. So I think this shows that there is uh, no ideas. No ideas are new, right? So the reason why I think slow productivity resonates with me and is resonating with so many of you is because there's actually an ancient idea here that we're hitting upon. So Festina Lente, make haste slowly, or to put it my way, uh, work slowly. How do I say it? Work slowly, uh, but relentlessly on what matters. A little bit less pithy, but I think that gets to the core of what all who have rediscovered this advice really liked. We should get a coin made, Jesse. Ryan Holiday has coins, you know. He has the Memento Mori, the Stoic coins. I think we need our yeah, own. Yeah, a coin uh, or a bookmark. That would be really nice. Because you read a lot of books. And do you think it would be a, a step too far in the narcissistic direction if I minted gold coins where it was my face on one side and, and then Festina Lente on the other side. So you could just, people could just look at, and like a general, you know, like I would have a garland, uh, didn't they wear garlands of, of, uh, plants. I don't know which like one. Like in the Sopranos they, when he got that, uh, painting commissioned of him on the horse. Did you which I, one? exactly. And, and I think viewers, listeners don't know this, but, uh, there is a giant mural of me dressed like a Roman emperor on a horse <laughs> inside the deep work HQ. And I'm just pointing forward, and it, it, yeah, it says Festina Lente. <laughs> uh, maybe that'd be maybe that'd be a step too far. Uh, anyways, that was cool though. Uh, the, the only, here's the only sad thing is uh, I came across like my Festina Lente rabbit hole was after the manuscript for Slow Productivity was already done, so it's actually not in the book. So this is uh, it's validation of the ideas in the book that came later, but it, it came too late to actually make it into the book itself. So I don't know if that's sad or, or cool, but there we go. All right, so what I want to move on to is uh, some questions that are going to be uh, roughly you know, roughly associated with this slow productivity, slowing down, working with what matters theme of this episode. Before we do, though, I want to talk briefly about one of the sponsors that makes this show possible, and that is our good friends at Henson Shaving. So here's the thing about Henson Shaving. They sell this uh, beautiful precision milled razor that you can then use with standard cheap off the shelf safety razor blades. And this this beautifully milled aluminum razor, uh, what makes it so good other than the fact that it just looks good and it's heavy and it's well balanced is that Henson's business is precision manufacturing. Before they got into the razor game, they worked on aerospace design and uh, parts manufacturing. So they have these aerospace grade CNC machines that can build really precise metal products. That's what allows them to make a metal razor that extends just 0.0013 inches beyond. The blade goes just 0.0013 inches beyond the housing of the razor itself. That's what allows a 10 cent standard razor blade when combined with their beautifully milled razor to give you a clean shave, 
without the diving board effect that causes nicks and that causes clogs. I use the Henson razor and I do because A, it's a beautiful tool and B, because over time it's cheaper. You pay more up front for this beautiful milled piece of metal, but then you're using 10 cent blades with it, which means it does not take long before your overall cost to use a Henson razor is much cheaper than having to use a subscription service or buy the pharmacy plastic packaged razors. So you save money, you get a better shave, and uh, it's a beautiful tool for those of us who really like technology done right. So it's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash Cal to pick the razor for you and use code Cal and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart and then when you type in that promo code Cal, the price of the blades will drop to zero. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash Cal. I also want to talk about our good friends at the oh-so-easy-to-pronounce ZocDoc. ZocDoc is one of these uh, apps that makes so much sense. It's hard to believe that it wasn't around before. All right. So here's how it works. Let's say uh, you need a new doctor. You know, like in my case, my old doctor left or you're looking for a new type of doctor. You didn't have one before. How would you normally do this? I don't know. No one knows. You start asking friends, hey, what doctor do you use? And then you call the doctor. And if you live in a city like I do, they're like, no, we don't have any availability. And if anything, we're mad at you for even asking. Of course we don't. Or you find a doctor with availability, but they don't take your insurance. or They turn out to the, the not be so good. There's a painting of them on a horse like a Roman emperor in the waiting room. And you didn't know about this. This is where ZocDoc enters the scene. It is an app that allows you to search for the type of doctor you're looking for that's in your area, that takes your insurance, that has available appointments, and you can read reviews right there to see, okay, do they have weird paintings in their hallway? It's what makes it easy to find a new health care provider. So I think this is just a great idea. Uh, I need some sort of doctor, I need a dentist, I need this specialist, ZocDoc, search, I'm looking for this area, availability, this insurance, boom, here's some options, uh, what's the reviews, ooh, this one looks good, uh, maybe I can even book it online using the app itself. So there are thousands of top-rated doctors on ZocDoc, and it will help you find them. All right, so it's a free app where you find these amazing actors, and in most cases, doctors, not actors, and in most cases can book the opponent, the uh, appointments right there online man actors and opponents that's a separate type of act separate type of app right there and act my god jesse i said actors opponents and act all of those i mean essentially what i think i really want to do here is uh fight a screen actor and somehow that's overtaking (laughs) me as i think about zoc doc now forget all that it's a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top rated patient review doctors and specialists filter for the ones to take your insurance, the ones that are located near you. They can treat almost any condition you're searching for. It's just a smart way to find health care uh, providers. All right. So go to ZocDoc.com slash deep and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then you can find a book, a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash deep zocdoc.com slash deep you know i'm thinking about actors jesse it's because our listeners are uh aggressively shaming me about the fact that there is no large format movie theater near hanover new hampshire and they are aggressively shaming me and i'm talking a dozen messages at least that i am not driving 90 minutes to get to an imax screen to see oppenheimer really and i wish i could I wish I could, but it's, it, the issue is uh, they got me booked pretty, pretty seriously up here, <laughs> up in Hanover. Dartmouth has been doing a lot of events in addition to my class, a lot of talks, a lot of classroom visits. I'm all over the place, so I can't just take a day off in the middle of the week, and now we have visitors up here, and I don't know that I'm going to make it to an IMAX while I'm still up here. I am going to go see it in the next couple of days in 35 millimeter. It leaves the local theater here in Hanover on Thursday. So I have to go find, I'm going to go see it in 35 millimeter. And then I'm just going to hope one of the specialty theaters in DC is doing an extended run or, or will bring it back and play it in large format. But man, they're really telling me, uh, let me tell you this. There's one listener who said they flew back from Bavaria 
to the States. Really? So they could see Oppenheimer in the IMAX. So I haven't seen why, it yet. Oh, man. They're going to be mad at you now, Jesse. If you don't see it in Mad Dog format, has talked about it. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I hear it's really good, but I heard it's like probably 25 minutes too long. Yeah. Well, I think there, yeah, there's a, like a long uh, 70 millimeter sequence of just fire from the, mm. the from the uh, the main explosion scene where they show the Trinity test and he they built a super high speed IMAX camera so they could film real fire. Anyways, I'm excited about it, but that's why I have actors on my mind because man, I've been oh so seriously shamed by our by our listeners. I do miss that about DC. I'm very much looking forward to getting back to movies. Nice movie theaters, big formats, seeing really interesting movies. That's that's not what you do up in rural New Hampshire. So it's it's a uh, it's a nice break, but I am looking forward to getting back to seeing some serious movies. All right, we should get back to some questions. Is what we should do because we have some interesting ones to get into today. Uh, Jesse, start us off. Who do we have here? All right, first question is from Trent. I feel like my team is suffering from a fast productivity bias. We use Scrum, but our schedules are overloaded. And too many items being prioritized haphazardly, leading to me and my team feeling burned out. How can I help my team and client move towards slow productivity and avoid them feeling anxious about not delivering enough work? Well, I think the, the good news here is that you do actually have in place a workflow management system that is very compatible with a more sustainable slow productivity. So for the, the un- uh, for the unknowledgeable listener, the listener who doesn't know about Scrum, this is an, uh, a methodology used commonly in software development for keeping track of and organizing work on software projects. And, and there's a bunch of key ideas to it, but, but essentially you work uh, in short iterative sprints. So instead of trying to plan a very large software development project out from scratch, we'll do this and it'll take one week and this will take two weeks and you have a six month plan. The Scrum mindset says, okay, what's the next thing we want to add? Let's just focus on that. This person's doing it. Spend two days, get it done. Let's test it and then see what should come next. So it's a more iterative way of building software. Now, often the work being done in Scrum is itself tracked using a metaphor of cards pinned up on a board under columns. So this is a technique that comes from a related system called Kanban. Not to confuse everyone, but Scrum often uses Kanban boards to keep track of the work. But but the way to imagine this is you have a, a card, be it virtual or physical, for all the different features you might want to add to your software. And they're in a sort of holding tank column. And then there's a column for, okay, this is being worked on. Uh, and you move something over there when one person is working on it. And then that's what they focus on uh, until they're done. And then it gets moved to the testing column typically and into the this is done column. Okay. So this is the setup that Trent has. And he's saying the issue is we have this setup, but we're just moving too many things to the working on column. And we're going really fast to keep up with all these different things we want, want us to get done. And we're working all the time and on multiple things at a time and we're burning out. So technically all they need to do is just slow down the pace. They have the structure there. They need to say, let's spend more time on each of these things. So when we move a card to the working on column, let's give that person more time to get it done. And they have to reduce overlap. Let's not put four things in the working on column for the same person. Let's put one thing at a time or two things at a time and let them finish that before the next thing comes. So there's a knob here you can turn to slow down the workload. Now, the two questions are, is this going to make you worse? Is your team going to be less capable if you do this? And then the second question is, regardless of that, is your client going to accept it? And let's tackle those both separately. Is it going to make your team worse? Are you going to actually be slower? The answer there is almost certainly no. It's one of the key ideas in slow productivity. The first principle is do fewer things. And the, one of the key explanations for that is doing fewer things does not necessarily mean that you produce at a slower rate. Everything that is on your plate in the moment to work on brings with it an overhead. Some of this overhead is just purely cognitive. I just, I have to think about this and I'm working on this both consciously and unconsciously. And some of it is actual logistical or administrative. Once I'm working on something, I might have to talk to other people about it. I might have to have conversations about it. There's email or Slack messages going back and forth about it. So there's actual uh, literal overhead that the time uh, takes up time. So when you put more things on your plate in a given period of time, you have more overhead. 
When you have more overhead, it means you have less time to work on the work itself and you have less cognitive capacity capable to dedicate it to it when you actually do the work. What does this mean? It takes longer to get those things done. So if you put three things on your plate on your Kanban board as part of your Scrum protocol, if you put three things on your plate instead of one, you're not, doing, uh, you're not working three times faster. You're not getting three times as much done this week or this month because those three things are going to take longer to get done. And the quality will probably be lower as well. If you put those things one after another, the time required to execute them if they got your full focus would be less because there's less overhead getting in the way. So going one after another might end up taking less time than putting all three on your plate and trying to finish them. So no, you're not going to be a worse producing team if you start to pull back a little bit on how many things you're moving from this collective coming up column into the individualized working on column. All right, so what about your clients? Well, here's the thing with your clients. Two things can help. One, let them just see the results. Things are getting done. When they zoom out to the weeks or monthly scale, they say things are getting done. Features get added. We're happy with the work. So have some faith that because you aren't actually producing at a slower rate, your client will notice this. The second thing you can do is just have a good transparency right, with the client. All right, thank you. Here's the feature. It's on our list of things to work on. In fact, we'll give you some visibility into our Kanban, not the exact Kanban board, but some sort of uh, lower fidelity collection of it where you can see, yes, this is exactly where this feature is. It's in our holding pin. Here's the ones we're working on now. Okay, these are done. These are the next ones we're working on. Hey, you can see here on priority, this is probably four or five features back, but it's moving down the list. Clarity can give you all sorts of grace when it comes to client, uh, client work. Being very clear to a client, they see what you're working on, how you're working on it, they see the speed with things are getting done, they see your system, that is gonna get you a lot of grace from the client. The thing that gets clients upset, the things that get clients demanding that you answer their emails at all time, the things that gets clients saying, just do this now, I don't wanna wait, is not trusting you. Not trusting, I don't know when this is gonna get done or who's gonna work on it. As long as the client feels like it's essentially up to them to badger an individual, with email or Slack until they can get that person to do something, that it's on the client's plate, it's on their head, they have to keep track of it until it gets done, and they have to keep bothering you until it does, then you're not gonna have any grace. And they're gonna say, just do it, just, I don't know, work on it. But when they see that transparency, it's in the system, here it is. I see it moving down the list of priorities. I see things are being executed well and fast. Then they're gonna give you a little bit more breathing room. So I think you're half of the way there, Trent, because you have the system in place. Now you just need to turn the knob down on workload, give a little more transparency to your client, and trust they'll see that the way you're doing this is actually producing results. And I think you will be able to slow things down. All right, what do we got next, Jesse? All right, next question is from Ben. One challenge I still have with time blocking is knowing how much time to allocate to a specific task or project. For example, as a product manager, I can spend hours or days doing customer market discovery to decide if a new feature is worth pursuing, or I can spend two hours and get a good enough answer. Does it make sense to allocate time to a task or project based on your appetite versus how much you can afford to give it? How much you can afford to give it, I think, is the right starting place. So if, if you have an open-ended task or project that you need to work on, and you say, I don't really know how long uh, I'm supposed to spend on this because maybe there's not a clear done point. Like the example given here, Ben gave was researching and, and you can always keep researching. I think the right thing to do here is to fix a reasonable amount of time, block off that time when you work on it, use that the scarcity of that time to like push you to really focus. Okay, when I'm working on this, okay, I have two hours. I really want to get uh, a lot done in this two hours. I want to be very careful about it. And then when you're done, you're done. And then here's the thing, let negative feedback change you. So if it turns out this is too short of time, uh, it's not enough research, and in the end, the report was not good, we didn't land the client, wait until you have that negative feedback. Let that negative feedback change what you do. Don't proactively guess, oh, let me do five hours, let me do six hours. Do what the time you hope from a scheduling perspective it might actually take. Eh, two hours would be great. That's reasonable given how many of these discovery reports I have to do. And do your best to make that time work. And if you get negative feedback, then change something. But even there, so even there, if you get the negative feedback of I didn't spend enough time on this, before you simply make your response be more time next time this comes up, 
Focus first on process. Well, what did I do during those two hours? I was just on the internet. I was just gathering stuff. Maybe there's a better way to have done this. Okay, I need to, what would have been better? Uh, Oh, I see. If I knew specifically working backwards from the report I was going to write, I could get the three big points I want to make. And then I could systematically search in this example for five sources for each of those points. Because I want to, I want to quote three things and give a summary. You start thinking through how could I have better of organized my approach during the time I gave this to get the better result. Eight times out of 10, that's what you need. And then the other two times out of 10, it might be some combination of I need a better process and I need more time. But at least it's an evidence-based increase of the footprint of this task on your schedule. Where this used to come up in my early work was actually helping students with how they studied for test. This was very common where where students would just say, um, I'm going to study open-ended. I have a test. It's a math test. I'm just going to study as much as I can because I don't want to feel guilty. I'll stay up all night. And then let's say they didn't get the result. And there, sometimes their instinct would be, maybe I just have to study more. And I would say, no, 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 we need to go back. Um, first of all, we need to restrict your study time. You should not be staying up all night. And they get really worried about this. Uh, and maybe they try this and they get an even worse grade. And they say, okay, now let's go back and figure out how do we change this? And almost always the answer was process. I used to call this back in the early days of my newsletter and blog, the post-exam post-mortem. I would say, man, it's the important thing to do. If you worried, you know, I studied for three hours and I got a bad grade before you just say, let me study all night again. Do a post-exam post-mortem. Look at the exam questions you got wrong and answer the question for yourself. What should I have done differently to get a better grade? Specifically, what activities during the hours I spent preparing were a waste of time and what activities did I not do that would have really helped? And this is how you evolve over time if you're a student, much more time efficient and effective study habits. You realize, for example, uh, reading over the notes was meaningless. I needed to be doing active recall. And the best way to do active recall is on index cards. I should just build those index cards like right after every class. So I have my study index cards growing and here's exactly what I should be putting on them. You begin to innovate based on what's actually effective. The same thing holds for other types of work as well. So take a guess. Here's a reasonable amount of time. If it doesn't get you the results you want, do a postmortem. How could I have changed what I did in that time to have gotten more? And because I'm telling you this evidence-based upgrade of process eight times out of 10 is going to solve your problem. If anything, you might even be able to reduce, you know, say, Hey, if I do this right, two hours was too much. An hour is fine. If I really know what I'm supposed to do here. So that's what I would suggest. Start a, start a optimistically, start ambitiously, and then aggressively adjust and evolve what you do in that time to get better and better results. And I I think you'll find that this open-ended wandering of, I don't know, I spent all day working on something that'll go away pretty quick. All right. What do we have next? All right. Next question is from Nathan. In Cal's image on Apple Podcasts and other podcast players, Cal's right adjustable headband is a little longer than the left. Please help. (laughs) Oh, yes. Okay. Let's be honest. This has nothing to do with slow productivity and Festina Lente. Uh, But it's an interesting question (laughs) that I think we should... I want to address because there's an interesting answer to it. So I'm actually going to load up uh, let's load this up on the screen here. Let's see. All right. I'm going to the deep life.com. That has a big picture of the, the album art. All right. Let's share this. I'm going to share this on the screen. This is a bit of a tangent everyone, but I think it's interesting. <laughs> okay. So let's get to the bottom of this. I've heard about this before. All right. Here's the album cover art for those who are watching, uh, for those who are watching on youtube.com or the deep life.com episode 260. Okay. Here's the album cover art. So which, which ear is he saying is longer, Jesse, the right, the left Cal's yeah. right. Adjustable headband is a little longer than the left. Okay. Now, Jesse, do you remember the explanation for that? Cause I, I remember this. No. All right. So my memory, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. My memory is here's the issue. The image that they use, the photo they use to make this cover art had right over, you know, on the right side, a microphone because when I'm doing the podcast, I, I have a microphone over there. Right. And they, you, we didn't want the microphone in this picture. So my, my memory is that the team, uh, our web team or design team that worked on this copied the left side 
and moved it over to the right side. So I think like the, the headphone and part of my face on the right side, they copied from the, the left side that was not obstructed by the microphone. So they could have a picture of me uh, without a microphone because typically I'd have a microphone right on my right on my right side. So I think that is why the headphone look a little bit weird in the cover art is because they copied and pasted and just flipped over the left side to the right side. And in doing that, they didn't exactly line it up. <laughs> so yes, my headphones are, I never I noticed it. it until now, actually. Yep. I, I don't know why I remember that, but <laughs> it's a little tidbit. Um, I mean, of course the easier thing to do is just to been, take a photo without the microphone, which is what we do for our thumbnails now. But I think at the time they, they just, they, they had the photo and they wanted to keep, keep moving. So there you go. This is critical information for the masses. But <laughs> I thought that'd be fun to do. All right, let's keep rolling. What do we have next? All right, next question is from Natalie. My partner and I have very different understandings of time. Something that could take me 10 minutes, for example, watering houseplants, might take him an hour. Not because he's not capable of doing it faster, just because he moves slowly. He often complains there's not enough time in the day. Are there people in the world that really just operate on a different plane of time because of their mindset about responsibilities and adulting obligations? Well, I think there's two possible things going on here, and it's probably some combination of the two. So first of all, I want to take this point. You know, Is it possible that some people on certain type of work just are fundamentally slower? And this might be controversial, but I think the answer here is yes. And because I'm using myself as an example here, there are certain things in my life I cannot do fast. In particular, getting ready, like getting ready in the morning to go to work or getting ready in the morning to, to you know, or whatever, to go to an event or to or prepare for the podcast. I cannot do that fast. And I try. I mean, I've, I, I have systems I've tried I've uh, with timers and different steps and I lay things out and I don't know why. I just can't get ready for anything in under 15 or 20 minutes. It just takes me forever. And I don't know where these inefficiencies are coming out and I've really tried to squeeze them out of my life and I don't know why I, I can't do those logistical steps fast. And it's not even hard logistical steps. It's not like I have to put on elaborate makeup or do a complicated hairdo. It just takes me a really long time. My wife, by contrast, when it comes time to get ready for something, uh, it's like Superman in the phone booth. She's like, hold on one second. Like the door will kind of swing shut and then swing back open and she's completely ready. I have no idea how she does that. And I've tried for years to be faster and I don't know where these inefficiencies are coming from. I just can't do that particular thing fast, right? So there may be, in our response here, there may be some, something to this that some people for some types of things, it's just the, the inefficiencies aggregate and they are just slower. And that's just who they are. Uh, and it's not due to lack of trying. On the other hand, we have this other potential issue which you hint at here which is a mindset issue, a mindset issue about uh, this word, which I don't always love, but adulting. So this mindset issue of, ah, I don't, this is not the type of stuff I should have to do or the type of stuff I want to do. And a almost like the toddler not wanting to put their shoes on. All oh, right, I guess I'll, I'll water the plants. It's like th this mindset of someone is like putting an obligation on your shoulder that you're like, I shouldn't have to deal with this. And I'm for sure not going to give this any alacrity. That is also a common thing, especially with younger adults. So that you're, you're making this transition from a sort of less structured, less urgent student life to a professional life where now we own a house and I have a job and I have to do these various things. Now for most people, if you end up having kids that that pushes the adulting woes right out of you because it's uh, no, you got to just do everything fast and it's hard. And there, there is no, I don't want to change the diaper. Eh, the kids scream. You're going to have to do it. But in that key adult period where you're no longer a college student, but you no longer, you're not a middle-aged father of three, this type of mindset does happen. So there is a slowness that can come simply from not wanting or being fully on board with having to do the things you have to do. If that's what's going on here, Natalie, uh, with your partner, then here uh, he probably just needs to grow the hell up, right? This is a place where the answer is, hey, you are an adult. 100 years ago when you're 18, you'd be you know, running a household. Get over it. You have to do stuff. Be organized. Get things done. Be responsible. 
It's no one's fault that life has a lot of things you have to do. There's no one for you to complain to or gripe to that life requires you to fill out paperwork and pay bills and do your taxes and you actually have to water plants and uh, you have to dust things because otherwise they get really dusty. Just, okay, get over it. Look, you haven't been drafted to fight in a war and we are, we're not losing 30% of our population to the plague, so things could be worse. Grow the hell up. And so I think that's, that's a, a perfectly sound reaction if that's what's going on. So I think it's some combination. There might be very specific tasks that he is just... Uh, slow at, and again, I can attest from personal experience, some things, some people just can't do fast. I mean, again, it's time to get ready in our house. 10 minutes later, I'm pondering the reality of the socks I'm holding where, you know, my, my wife has not only gotten ready, but has gone to the event and come back already. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but I'm like, okay, brown, but what is brown? Is this a brown sock? Where do socks come from? Uh, you know, meanwhile, uh, she's building, she's finished building a deck. So there is some things that we just go slower on. But if you sense the mindset is, I shouldn't have to do this work. And that's why I'm being slow. Uh, you can tell him Cal says, grow the hell up. Uh, yeah, life is complicated. Now what? That needs to be the motto, especially of people who are just entering, just entering adulthood. All right. Uh, what do we got? Let's do let's do another question. All right, what do we got next? Hi, right, next question is from Steve. Hi, Cal. How has using the rem the remarkable two tablet changed or influenced how you use your working memory dot text file, if at all? Has your working memory file habits usage evolved over time? So again, this question is also not directly related to slowness or slow productivity, but we talked about my remarkable tablet in a recent episode, so I figured this would be a good follow-up. All right, so what is Steve referencing when he says my working memory.txt file? This is a long time habit I've talked about a bunch of times on the show where on the desktop of my computer, I keep a plain text file, no formatting. This is just straight up text edit on uh, my Mac. It's called working memory.txt. And I really do, when I'm on my computer, use it like an extension of my memory. I can type notes and ideas I'm trying to organize, keep track of things. It's, it's taking my working memory and extending it. And so the question is, now that I have a Remarkable 2 tablet, do I use that for my working memory instead of the text file on the computer? And Steve, here's what I found works best for me, at least in the last few weeks of experimenting with this. When I'm doing work on my computer itself, I use the working memory.txt text file on my computer. And the reason is I can type faster than I can write. So I really can capture so much information in this working memory.txt file. I mean, right, I'm looking at it right now on my screen. Uh, earlier when I was prepping this podcast, for example, when I'm grabbing questions I want to answer on the show, I just paste them into working memory.txt so that I have a place for them. And then I delete some I don't like, and then I copy them from working memory.txt eventually to my script. I have a list on here now called major admin. So I'm keeping track of a few major things I really want to get done in the week ahead. I, I'm kind of keeping track of this on here for now. Uh, I have some notes on now that my new time block planner is back, I can do daily metric plan, uh, tracking again. So I've thrown some notes on here about the, the codes I'm using for the metrics that I've been tracking up here at, at Dartmouth this summer. So all of this is just on this file. It grows and expands and contracts as I work on my computer throughout the day. It's just so fast. It can hold so much information. It's so easy to scroll through and see. I love it as a tool. And I still use that when I'm on my computer. However, one of the advantages of my uh, Remarkable is when I'm away from my computer, I can use uh, the Remarkable as my working memory file. And what I actually use, if you're a Remarkable user, there's something called a quick sheet. So it's a, a notebook that's very easy to get to. So you don't, it's not, a, it's always there. It's called a quick sheets. I always just have a page in the quick sheets for my daily non-computer working memory.txt. And this has been really helpful. Uh, if I'm out walking or thinking, I can jot things down on there. It's been very helpful during class, during the lecture for the course I'm teaching up here to be able to take notes on things or uh, like if we're having a discussion, I can keep track of some points, remember to come back to this, or uh, I can quickly sketch out the structure I want for the class that day. So there's been many occasions where I'm not at my computer where having a notebook to use as a substitute working memory.txt has been useful. I wasn't really doing that as much before I got my Remarkable, but now the Remarkable is always with me. So now I have a uh, 
dual format working memory, uh, we could call it discipline, computer for when I'm on the computer, the quick sheet on my remarkable when I'm away from, uh, when I'm away from the computer. But the key thing here is having a place unstructured, easily accessible, where you can work through your thoughts, capture things, move things around is really critical and it is really useful. And all you have to remember to integrate this into a reasonable organizational system is that when you do your daily shutdown, if you have like a time block planner, you'll have the shutdown complete checkbox to check every day. One of the things you have to review is your working memory sources. And this means throughout the day, not only can you use this just to temporarily hold things you don't want to keep in your mind or temporarily organize information, you can take notes on things that you don't know what to do with in the moment. And it's just one of your David Allen inboxes that you look at at the end of the day. So you have this peace of mind throughout your day that as you capture things on there, it's not going to be forgotten. And you look over at the end of the day and say, okay, is any of this I need to move into one of my more permanent systems or put something on my calendar? Or in some cases, I'll just leave it on there. So yeah, I use this thing every day and I need to see this tomorrow. So I'll just leave it on there. As long as you add a review of your working memory uh, inboxes, be them on your computer, be them on a paper notebook, be them on something like a remarkable, as long as you add that review to your shutdown routine, this becomes a very powerful system for expanding your ability to remember and organize things. So I think it's a good question because it gets to this sort of cybernetic complexity about what type of tools to use in what type of situations to extend your actual ability to organize things. What do you do on the weekends in terms of, cause you don't have a shutdown on the weekends, right? I don't have a shutdown on the weekends. Uh, the new, so the, the new time block planner, I redesigned the weekends into, I call them the weekend pages. And so now my new time block planner has, uh, and I'll show this next week on the show when I bring one down to the studio. Um, so Saturday and Sunday has a uh, like a column that you can use for both metric tracking if you want to track metrics on the weekend and roughly structuring notes, right? So, you know, my Sunday box for this weekend is where I had the reminder that, you know, we were recording at 10 a.m. Under that, I have a pretty extensive weekend capture. So you, there's space for you to capture ideas and thoughts to come up during the weekend. And then the idea is when you get to the uh, next week and you're making your weekly plan and the weekly plan now faces the weekend pages, the captures right there. And you can see mm -hmm. and process all of those things when you set up the weekly plan. So I actually, I've, I, uh, I rewrote or updated the introduction to the planner to talk about this new weekend pages discipline, but now it's great. You can have this rough plan for your weekend. You can do metric tracking if you want, and you can capture things that happen throughout the weekend in the, the planner on those pages. And then when you build your weekly plan, so Monday morning or, or whenever you do it, uh, you see all the stuff you captured and that's when you integrate it. Got so it. it. Cause this was a key thing for me is having a, a consistent place for capture, uh, for the weekend. I felt it was better. What I was doing before with the old planner is I would often write these notes on the Monday page so that when I got the Monday, I would see them, but I prefer them to be on their own weekend page so that you know this is where these thoughts came from. They came from the weekends. Mm -hmm. The Monday task list can be for Monday. So, uh, yeah, again, all the stuff you tweak, but this works well for me. All right, so I wanted to end today, uh, this segment at least, with a case study. So I always appreciate when, when readers send in their own uh, experiences with this advice. All right, so this case study, and this is very relevant. I mean, I think this is very relevant to slow productivity. Um, because this is a case study. This is from Joni from Trinidad. And she's, she's offering, she thinks, a perspective about slow productivity and motherhood that is uh, not always emphasized. And I, I think it's important to get different experiences in on these issues. So I want to read this case study that was sent to me from Joni from Trinidad. She says, I'm a 37-year-old single mother and researcher in Trinidad. I was performing poorly uh, as an undergraduate student uh, until an unplanned pregnancy at age 21. At this point, the time constraints of motherhood pushed me into what I now understand as self-enforced blocks of deep work. I went on to graduate with a 3.96 GPA, was valedictorian, and received a full postgraduate scholarship to do my PhD in the States where I ended up having my second child and completed my PhD at age 30. I'm currently active in research and teaching in my country and applying to do a postdoc. 
Uh, I am disappointed at the lack of female perspectives about deep work. There are gender inequities in academia, not just between men and women, but in particular between mothers and non-mothers. I've also always been intrigued at the ways in which I am less productive when my children go to visit their father. In my experience, care work does not necessarily detract from deep work, but with the right approach enforces and enhances it. Care work provides a rich and insightful depth of perspective that adds to the quality of deep work and a powerful impetus for an alternative identity outside of motherhood. I would argue that a life entrenched in deep work alone is one that is out of touch with humanity, reality, and meaningful research objectives. With the current anti-natalist trends, especially in academia, and the prevailing narrative, narrative that motherhood leads to career suicide and an unfulfilled life, I think it is really important to present and discuss a more balanced perspective on deep work. I love your work, Cal. That kind of makes it seem like I wrote that. <laughs> I love your work, Cal, not I love your work from Cal. <laughs> uh, anyways, I thought that was really interesting. Um, because there is, you know, I think this is a trend, right? There is often a trend of seeing various things like care work, be it with kids or be it, uh, you know, sick relatives, maybe parents, aging parents at home, to always see that as uh, antagonistic to the production of meaningful work or your ability to produce work. And so I think Joni gives a, an interesting alternative expl- note, which said that's not true for everyone. In fact, for her and for others, you know, uh, care work can actually help focus and enhance and add more depth to uh, your other work. And your other work can add more depth and meaning to your identity with care work. And I think that's a really interesting perspective. We discussed that some in my interview with Yale uh, from Brown. This was out in the spring sometime. So I don't know how far back that was, but she, we, we talked about this where she, where she went into, um, was it Yale, Yale, uh, Showborn. I don't know if I get her last name, right. I'm, I'm trying to remember this right off the, uh, right off the cuff, but you go find this interview back from a few months ago. And she got into this, I think about, cause she studies the psychology of work and in particular it's intersections with other identities like care work. And, and I think she had some good points about backing up what Joni said here that, it, that it, it actually can lead to a uh, more sophisticated approach to your work. It can lead to a more sophisticated and durable self-identity. So I think it's a really cool thread to actually uh, pull on there. Different people have different experiences, but I think that's worth saying. This is not a zero-sum time game. So it's not uh, whoever has more time to dedicate to intellectual work will have a better result than those who have less. And that's the entire zero sum game. And so if someone has more time than me, uh, especially for reasons I can't control, then all I should have is upsetness or bitterness towards that person. I think Joni gives us interesting alternative perspectives here. It's complicated. What produces really interesting work is not just time. It's not just complete lack of other commitments in your life. So I thought that was a cool perspective. Also, Trinidad. That I'm, I really like seeing, Jesse, the different places where we have listeners write or call in from it's i think we're we're getting pretty international we, we uh, trinidad i don't know if we've had trinidad before um we've been hearing more from various african countries that i don't think we had listeners before certainly india we have a there's a big listenership in, in india a lot of different european places brazil and we have a good listener group i've learned in brazil so i i do like the international i think that's really interesting and i love I love learning the different ways that different countries think about these, these concepts because it, it really can differ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The audience is very, very diverse, like all sorts of countries. Um, okay. So what I want to do is we have a, a final segment. I want to get to the books I read in July as we do when we get to the new month. Uh, before we do though, let me just briefly mention another sponsor that helps make this show possible. And that's our, Longtime sponsors at Blinkist. The Blinkist app enables you to understand the most important ideas from over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. So when you use the Blinkist app, you can download to either read or listen to 15 minute summaries of all of these nonfiction books and podcasts. They're called Blinks. It takes about 15 minutes to digest. Uh, Jesse and I use Blinkist. The way we talk about it is a uh, companion to anyone who wants to embrace the reading life. If you want to make reading an important part of your life, and we think you should, it's very hard to live a deep life 
without the source of ideas and introspection and knowledge you get from books, use a tool like Blinkist to age you. And the way that I use it and the way Jesse uses it is to triage potential books to read. If a book seems like it's something that might be worth covering, we will first listen to or read the Blink. Jesse tends to listen to them. I'll either, I mean, read them, I should say. I'll read the summary or listen to them. I'm, I'm happy to do both. And it usually gives you a really good sense. Should I buy and read this whole book? Or is it not what I thought it was? Or maybe it is what I thought it was, but this 15-minute summary, that's basically all I need to know from it. So it's a fantastic way to figure out what books to read and what books to not, and to still learn the key points from the books you don't read. So you still have those at your fingerprints, uh, at your fingertips. You still have them to construct structures of knowledge. Uh, inside your mind. So if you're a reader, you probably should use Blinkist. They also have this uh, cool other feature right now. Um, what is it called here? Blinkist Connect that allows you to share your premium account so you can get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. That's a limited time feature, but I think it's really cool. It's a way to bring someone else into the Blinkist fold if you sign up and like it. So right now Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash deep to start your seven day free trial and get 25% off a of Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash deep to get 25% off on a seven day free trial. That's Blinkist.com slash deep. And don't forget that right now for a limited time, you can use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You will get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. I also want to mention my longtime friend, Adam Gilbert and his company, My Body Tutor. My Body Tutor is a 100% online coaching program that solves the biggest problem in health and fitness, which is lack of consistency. So the way it works, if you work with My Body Tutor is you are matched up with a coach online. So one of the My Body Tutor coaches they will work with you virtually to develop a fitness plan and a nutrition plan. How are you going to eat? What specific types of exercises, routines are we going to do to match your specific goals and your specific lifestyle? Then here's the key thing. Using the app, you check in every day. How did it go with the, what did I eat today? How did it go with the, the fitness routine? And you get feedback every day from your coach. So knowing that there is a real coach on the other side, Monitoring your progress pushes you to be consistent. It pushes you to actually do what you know you need to do. That's why My Body Tutor has been around for so long and is so successful. Now, the secret sauce here is not just that you have the daily coaching, but because it's online, it's much more affordable than actually working in person with a trainer and a nutritionist and bringing them to your house. So if you want to get healthier, you want to get in better shape, you want to clean up your diet, and you're worried about consistency, the solution is simple. Use My Body Tutor. So if you're serious about this, Adam will give you $50 off your first month if you mention deep questions when you sign up. Just say, this is why I signed up is because of deep questions. They will give you $50 off your first month. To find out more, go to mybodytutor.com. That's T-U-T-O-R, mybodytutor.com, and mention that you came because of deep questions. All right, uh, let's move on now to our final segment. Today, I wanted to review the books I read up here in New Hampshire in July of 2023. So the first book I read in July was Shadow Divers by Robert Kirsten. I had read this book before, back when it first came out. I, whatever the context was, I was just looking for a, a fun, fast read uh, that would be distracting. It's a fantastic nonfiction book. It's it's a classic of the narrative nonfiction genre. Uh, what it does is it follows a group of deep sea wreck divers from New Jersey. These are people who dive very deep, close to 200 feet deep. It's very, very dangerous to try to look at or explore shipwrecks. They find a U-boat, a Nazi U-boat that no one knew about sunk off the coast of New Jersey. And the book is about uh, their quest to figure out which U-boat is this. So you have to, they have to do these very dangerous dives 200 feet down, going into the twisted corridors of this old submarine. It's, it's one of these stories as a nonfiction writer you dream about coming across. I'm not going to spoil too much, but let me just say multiple people die. And there's multiple sort of hair-raising undersea uh, 
disasters that people have to try to escape from. So it reads like a Clive Cussler book, but it's all real. Um, I'd read it before, but it'd been a long time, uh, and it was just as good as I remembered. All right, the next book I read was Power in Progress, the new MIT Press book by Darren uh, Osmoglu and Simon Johnson. So what I've been trying to do up here is every morning I read a chapter from uh, an academic press book, sort of like kind of an intellectual book. This is part of my Dartmouth disciplines up here is I'm always working on just a straight up academics writing about ideas book. So this was the first one. I read this the week I was up here alone. Um, I, f I read it mainly the week I was up here alone in June, but I finished it in July. So I put it, I put it up there. Uh, this was a really interesting book. This is a, a philosophy of technology book. This, these are two MIT professors, Power and Progress. Essentially, their core point, it's kind of a thick, a thick book, but, but essentially their, their core point is the, the impact of technologies. A lot of the impact of new technologies has to do with the choices we make socially and politically about how we are going to allow those tools to, to function and spread. And that there, there are alternative, we look at, a, a you know, hey, this tool came along and it had this economic impact. So there's often alternative ways that tool could have impact, its impacts could have unfolded if we made different choices about how we're going to allow this tool to be used or not used, how we're going to integrate it into our lives. So it's, it's a sort of a, an extension of, of the social construction of technology direction of thought on philosophy of technology um, well argued. Uh, we could probably do a whole show on it. There, there are some, some points where I had some disagreement. Some points I thought were super compelling. I think some of the historical examples maybe were very, very good, whereas some of the applications to very modern technologies, it's just hard when they're new, but felt like it wasn't, didn't quite have its finger on the pulse or didn't quite feel accurate. Uh, but overall, it's a very powerful, a very powerful theory. These Types of theories are well known in philosophy of technology, but uh, this is very well articulated, very forcefully, forcefully delivered, and very relevant right now. I mean, I think this is what's happening right now with generative AI. There are a lot of, of people who are thinking, wait, we have some choice here about what we want this technology to do or not do. We, we're not just passive sitting back and this technology is going to do what it is going to do. The Authors Guild, for example, has this big petition out right now. 8,000 authors, including many, many big names, signed it. It was uh, an open letter to the artificial intelligence companies saying, essentially, don't use our books to train your models. It is not important for society or culture that we have generative AI models that can you know, write books in the style of various existing authors. You don't have our permission to use your books to train your models. It's a very interesting application of the, the ideas from power and progress put uh, into action. So if you've studied technology, you've probably heard of this book. It's been splashy, but I really enjoyed it. All right, next book I read, this I read on the, uh, essentially two of these books are plane ride books. This I, I read largely flying back to DC from New Hampshire. It was River of the Gods by Candice Millard. She also wrote, she's known for River of Doubt about Teddy Roosevelt's tr uh, trek, post-presidency trek to South America that almost killed him. River of the Gods is about the quest to find, uh, for the Europeans to find the source of the Nile. And basically, very well written. I love Candace's style. She's a, she's a very good writer. She adds a narrative, narrative thread to these otherwise complicated to research histories. Main takeaway you get from this, not a great, not a great job to be a, a 19th century uh, explorer. This is kind of what you come away from is, man, it was rough out there, just condition-wise and what they went through. I mean, the, the one character in this book, among other maladies to happen to him, is getting a spear stuck through his mouth. I think it got stuck into his the palate of his mouth. That's not great. Uh, there's another period where he just got swarmed by beetles, including one that went into his ear, and he couldn't get it out, and he tried anything he could to get it out. And, you know, it finally, like, it burst his eardrum. And, like, finally, over weeks and weeks, like, the, it kind of died in there. It got broken up by the earwax and pieces came out. And he could never hear out of that ear again. It's not, not fun. Let's put it that way. It's not, a, not fun to be Did a, he find a, the source? This one, yeah. And they did. They, they did finally find it. Um, they, it was interesting. They knew so little. Europeans knew so little about the interior of Africa until surprisingly late. Like, this is in the 18, mid-1800s. 
that they're doing this exploration. So the the big lake there, which they named Lake Victoria, but now I think the name has gone back to the the indigenous name, which I don't have on the tips of my fingers, is huge. It's like the second largest lake in the world or something like this. And they had no idea it existed. Uh, the, so what I learned, this is kind of cool about it. I guess the, the Nile flows north to south. No, no, south to south north. Um, so you would think, why not just get to the uh, Nile in Egypt, like where it empties into the Mediterranean, and just take a boat up? until you got to the source, right? Like, why, why couldn't you just do that? And the issue is there's this, re- this region of the Nile, uh, if you follow it south into Africa, where it's this massive, essentially like swampy marshland. So it, it, it's not just a clear river all the way up to its source. There's oh, so you this get huge lost? Period. You just get lost. In fact, you can't even like get boats yeah. to it because it's so choked with um, uh, vegetation and this and that. And it's huge. So you can't just take a boat easily people tried that you, you just get lost in this swamp you can't even navigate with a boat so you had to come in they came in from uh over by uh the arabian peninsula in east africa by the horn of africa i guess that's uh, maybe somalia now and they, they hiked in from the east that, that's how they they eventually found it there's a cool uh lincoln child book so lincoln child's a thriller writer um who sometimes writes with douglas preston who's also a New Yorker writer and who wrote that is the head of the Authors Guild, which wrote that letter we just talked about when talking about power and progress. He's the, the, the source of the letter to the AI companies. Anyways, his Lincoln Child often writes thrillers with him, and Lincoln Child also writes thrillers on his own. And he has a thriller that takes place in that swamp part of the Nile. And the, the, the premise is there's this tomb, this lost tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh that's under the waters of the swamp. And so it's like a classic Lincoln child techno thriller. I forgot the name of this particular book, but they bring in all this fancy equipment to the giant swamp land to, to find this thing. And they, they build these cassions and caissons and bring the water out. And they're trying to get access to this ancient buried tomb. That's under these massive swamps. Uh, it's a cool book, but not one. I Why do they want to know the source of the Nile so much? I don't know. People like to know these things. It was just, it was just yeah. a question. It's like this huge open question. Like, where's, what's the source of Nile? No one knew. And, it, and like people had asked this question since antiquity. Got but it. no, it's not. Yeah, it's not that it was uh, practical. Like, oh, we could make money. Like, it's not useful outside of just, this was the, the heyday of the British explorer and the royal. I'm Googling society. it right now. There's like a blue sign that says the source of the Nile. <laughs> it's like a stop sign. <laughs> Here it is. This is the source. Well, I mean, okay, so that's the other question. So it, it's this big lake, but in, in people then pushed it further to say, well, where are the headwaters that feed into this lake? And so you can, you can, keep, you can go beyond the lake and say, like, okay, here's the farthest source of water that pours into this giant lake. I would, it's a cool – there's these huge falls there. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking lake, at the lake pictures. Lake Victoria. Week. Um, there's these huge falls. There's like a riff in the earth. And the lake like pours over it with these like massive waterfalls, huge. It's really, really cool. I would love to see that. At some that point. beetle All thing right. sounds horrible. It was just horrible. Oh. It, okay. The next book I read was uh, called The Last Action Heroes by Nick the Selmier. I really like this book. You know, Jesse knows this. I love books about the movie industry. This is a book about the heyday of the 1980s action movie stars. Stallone, Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger, Seagal, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And it tells their stories and then the stories of what was happening in the movie industry. And I just thought it was fascinating. If you like movie stuff, it's just really fascinating. These guys were so larger than life that it was a very interesting, uh, very episodic. I listened to this on Audible because it, these type of books are great for it because each chapter is, okay, now we're going to Jean-Claude Van Damme. Now we're going to spend the chapter on Steven Seagal. They're, they're uh, self-contained. Really interesting to hear about. Like the, the the thing I came away with this from is what ended this era was basically Jurassic Park. And the reason why Jurassic Park ended this era, because the last action hero, this massive Schwarzenegger movie that bombed, came out the same weekend as Jurassic Park. And the reason why that ended it was we're very used to spectacle right now in a post-Jurassic Park world that are delivered via special effects. But in a pre-Jurassic Park world, we're talking the 80s, special effects were, I mean, the best things we could do is we could blow things up, but we didn't have computer effects. So these super muscled guys were in some sense a, uh, the spectacle. Like it was just, 
it's larger than life. Oh my God. Arnold Schwarzenegger or Stallone as Rambo is so muscled and over the top that it was a spectacle, right? Nowadays we get the spectacle by having really cool special effects done by computers. So we can see the transformers, you know, jumping over buildings and stuff like that. But when you couldn't do that, how do you make a movie larger than life? You put larger than life people into it and blew things up. So it was like, this was the special effects before there was really cool, spectacular special effects. It was these guys that were completely, either they were muscle bound to a degree that was uh, completely attention catching because it was so novel. You know, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger was just novelly strong or they were doing uh, crazy martial arts stuff. So like Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Seagal doing the judo, like they were doing crazy throwing people and doing splits and kicks in the air and all these type of crazy stuff. Um, it was spectacle. So we had to rely on larger than life humans doing larger than life things to get spectacle, blowing things up around them. Once Spielberg came along with Jurassic Park, we said, oh, we can make spectacle without having to just have a person be crazy to look at. We can now make a dinosaur. We can have robots. And, and that was the end of uh, relying on larger than life people just on their own to make a movie worth watching. It just wasn't as interesting anymore. Yeah, Schwarzenegger's strong, but the T-Rex, I have to look, it's a T-Rex. That's like more interesting more interesting than Schwarzenegger's biceps. So anyways, I thought it was cool. Uh, if you like movies and you grew up in that, uh, that era, like Jesse and I did, you'll probably like that book. Were you big in those? I mean, I was, uh, I saw all that stuff growing up. I just saw the Arnold documentary on Netflix and yeah, I watched through it. a lot of that stuff. I recommend the Arnold autobiography. I recommend that to everybody. I read that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah, I like the first half, like when I was talking about him, like working out and stuff. Like I thought it was better than book. having read the book. I was somewhat disappointed in the documentary. Like documentary was fine. Yeah, was cool I, knew to all see the, the I knew all the stuff in the documentary. I knew it already, and it was a little bit less. It was more cursory. All right, final book I read. This was another plane book. So this was maybe my. Well, I bought one book with one flight and the other book with the other. It's The Island by Adrian McKinty. It was like a big splashy thriller from last year, I think. Uh, a lot of fun. This is one of these books that's all third act, right? So it's just, it's set up in a thriller premise and then it's just 100% go until the book is over. So in this case, it's a family, uh, a family ends up stuck on this island with sort of in Australia with uh, deliverance style Australian hillbillies. And they, they accidentally, I mean, they actually kill some run someone over with their car anyways long story short they realize like they're gonna they're gonna kill them and so it's this uh mom and her stepkids are trying to escape on this island escape being killed by this whole family on this island and they're the only people on the island is this family there's no way off it's surrounded by shark infested waters they set this up early on when they bring the boat over you can see the sharks just surrounding the boat surrounded by shark infested waters full of all these crazy Australian hillbillies with all these weapons and motorcycles and the sun is beating down on them and they're just trying to escape and survive. And that's it. And it just goes and it just goes and the stakes are high and they're, they're doing terrible things to the people they capture. And that's the book. And it just goes, 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 uh, until the end. And then that's it. It's hard to pull off those, those full third, only third act type books. Like it's in the exciting climax the entire time. This one did it right. And it got a lot of acclaim. Uh, well, well done. I had a lot of fun with it. Don't read if you're squeamish, <laughs> but it was cool. It was cool. I mean, I wonder if they'll, you could probably do a movie about it. It's hard to do these movies that are all third acts. Nolan did it with Dunkirk. Dunkirk is all third act. If you watch that movie, it's just whole thing is the kind of, you're in the, climax everything's happening for the whole movie hard to do this book does it so anyways i liked it the island by adrian mckinty all right jesse i think that'll do it i think that's all uh, all we have to say today uh, i'll be back next week next week i think is the last hq north episode so enjoy it i will but i do look forward to getting back to the studio so we'll, we'll see you next week uh, up here and then back in DC for the weeks beyond that, if I did my math right. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if you like what you heard, you'll like what you see at youtube.com slash Cal Newport media video, full episodes and clips. See you next time. And until then, as always stay deep. If you enjoyed today's discussion of slow productivity, then you'll really like episode 254, where we talked about 
the laws of less. Just click right here to watch. In the end, the stuff that brought me back here, the stuff that brought me back as a fellow, was actually the stuff I spent years and years on. The slowly building up my writing craft, spending years on a, a book, 